Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I, I'll just start with a little bit about who these two guys are here. Um, Jim Hightower is uh, a commentator on American politics based in Austin, Texas. He, uh, he's, he also calls himself a recovering politician. Mm -hmm. And what he's uh, <laughs> really recovering from there is a, a couple of terms in which he, in terms of uh, office in Texas as the State Commissioner for Agriculture. And in the state of Texas, agriculture uh, is a big thing. And in that job, he, uh, he fought for uh, limiting the power of agribusiness, uh, respecting the rights of immigrant labor or, or any labor, and, uh, and promoting sustainable farming, organic farming, local, small family farms. So, and when he got elected twice doing that stuff, you can imagine that the, the big corporate business, agribusiness folks were not at all happy, and neither was uh, an up-and-coming uh, Texas politician named George W. Bush, who, uh, <laughs> who with his, uh, uh, his shotgun guy, Carl Rove, thought, this guy's a danger here. He could stand for governor and win, because he's, he's pretty good at campaigning. So they made, tried to make life hell for Hightower and his staff, and they didn't really succeed in that, but they did make Jim decide that they were much safer jobs than fighting George Bush for elected office, so he went back to being a media guy. And uh, about uh, 12 years ago, he and I, I was, uh, I grew up in Melbourne, and I put out a bunch of newspapers in Melbourne. There are plenty of people in this room old enough to remember Go Set, if you were teenagers. That was a rock and roll paper that I, I started way back. Then I did the Australian, launched the Australian Rolling Stone and a counterculture paper back in the 70s called The Digger. And when that was um, uh, overwhelmed by lawsuits, I went to the uh, <laughs> to a real journey around the world and, and, and wound up in New York City where I worked on a, a whole lot of different uh, magazines and organizations in the US that, are, that were uh, as far left as things can really afford to be in America. But wound up 12 years ago thinking, I, I want to put out my own political newsletter. And, uh, and that's not easy to do, but, but somebody I knew told me, a, a guy by the name of Ben Franklin, believe it or not, told me that Jim Hightower, whom I'd heard of, uh, also wanted to do a political newsletter. So we talked on the phone, and, and I said to Jim that I was going to, in my letter, we wouldn't bother to call senators and congressmen and congresswomen by their, where they supposedly come from, but. We'll, we'll tell the truth, we'll say, you know, John McCain, he's not really the senator from Arizona, he, he was the senator from the telecommunications industry. And, and Joe Biden, you know, he might have hung out occasionally in, in Delaware, but he was really the senator for credit card companies. And Hightower paused for a bit and then one up me, he said, I just finished a radio commentary where I'm demanding that all politicians wear their sponsors' logos on their suits like <laughs> race car drivers do. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, uh, we realized we were on the same track, shall we say. <laughs> so that's what brought us together. Uh, we started putting out a newsletter then, and uh, 12 or nearly thir 13 years later, it's still going. It has over 100,000 paying subscribers in America, which, uh, which is pretty amazing for uh, considering what, what we have to say. So I will get now to uh, what we have to say. Uh, Jim, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, of the United States established a form of government that uh, Abe Lincoln summarized as government of the people, for the people, and by the people. There's a lot more in it than that, but that's the essence of it. Now, that, you know, everyone knows that that's been, you know, honored more in the breach than anything. It's uh, it wasn't true then that that's what America's government was like, and it still isn't. But the question is, what elements of those noble founding documents do you think endure as, uh, as principles that people believe in, or, or at least as aspirations, uh, amongst the citizens of, of America, uh, whether they know the actual words of any of this stuff or not? Before I answer that, I think we need to say this is Philip Fraser. Oh, right. <laughs> sorry. 
And uh, yeah, it's been a joy over the years. That's our little newsletter, the Hightower uh, Lowdown, uh, that uh, that we've been putting out. But also, uh, Sahu Baron is, is back here as well. Wave at us, Sahu. Sahu is our design guru. She lives in Tasmania. Uh, <laughs> Philip is in uh, Australia near Byron Bay, and uh, about half the year in San Francisco. Uh, Deanna Zant uh, lives in New York City. Uh, myself and uh, my. Uh, uh, huge staff of uh, we have a, I often get questions uh, I need you to get your research department on this well we have the department of Laura <laughs> that's our research department so really it's two people there <laughs> about three people uh, and uh, where else are we we're, we're spread in Belgium where it's uh, who sometimes so we're, we're quite uh, global uh, yeah, our cartoonist our, lives in Des Moines yeah, yeah Des Moines <laughs> oh and our previous cartoonist uh, Matt Worker who was for 10 years with us here uh, just won the Pulitzer Prize in America for cartooning uh, so uh, but he had to leave our, our job before he got the prize <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> so back to the uh, back to the question uh, the other people, by the people, for the people that Lincoln referred to in those founding documents of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, the Declaration of, of Independence. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, none, none of those documents created democracy. Uh, what they did was to make some democracy possible. And in fact, in the first presidential election that elected the first George W., uh, George Washington, uh, that uh, in that election, uh, only 4% of the people were even eligible to vote. Uh, could not vote if you were a woman, uh, you were chattel. Couldn't vote if you were African American, you were slave. Couldn't vote if you were Native American, you were heathen. Couldn't vote if you did not own property, uh, it, own land, uh, because you were riffraff. Uh, so only 4% were eligible to vote. So it's not those, those documents that created democracy, but rather the ensuing generations of people who dared uh, to stand up and demand more democracy on the basis of those documents that led uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the de democratic progress that we've had uh, over the years, uh, over the generations, uh, uh, through hard-fought uh, efforts, uh, efforts by agitators, really, the suffragists and the, uh, the uh, populists and the wobblies and the anti-war people and the Cesar Chavez and the uh, you know, uh, environmental movement, the women's movement, right on down the line. Uh, and, and of course, you know, if, if you're an agitator, they, they make that a pejorative. But uh, in fact, uh, it, it's quite a, a, a noble position to hold. Uh, remember this, uh, the agitator is the cent center post in the washing machine that gets the dirt out. <laughs> so we, we need a lot of agitators uh, to have any possibility of, of democracy or any possibility of uh, egalitarian uh, progress in any nation. Uh, and uh, so those values uh, are still, still dearly held uh, in the guts and in the hearts and in the minds of the, of the American people, uh, but it's rarely appealed to by the politicians of either party. In fact, we have now a, a, pol a politics of narcissism in which the, the handful of the wealthiest people in our country and the, and the corporate powers uh, are demanding uh, that, uh, that the, the only role of government is to serve them, basically, to enhance the wealth and power of the few. Uh, so the people still hold this, these values of economic fairness, social justice, equal opportunity for all people uh, deeply within them. Uh, but the problem is, uh, well, Ben Franklin early on said that uh, the destiny of America is not power, but light. And the light that he had in mind was fairness and justice and opportunity for all, that beacon uh, to the world. Uh, but the problem today is we got too many five-watt bulbs sitting in 100-watt sockets you know, uh, in positions of power. Uh, and they have turned their back on those values uh, and, and on the founders, really. Uh, and instead are trying to impose a plutocracy uh, over our uh, democracy today. But that the values are still within the heart of the American people, so if we have a politics, and we do occasionally, more, more often local rather than national, that appeals to that, those politicians tend to win. Well, you said uh, uh, that the reality of government in the U.S. today is... Uh, well, and it's the reality we presented as we presented in our newsletter, the, the lowdown, uh, is of a system directed by politicians who are essentially paid agents of uh, various subsectors of the corporate America. And, and this year's presidential and congressional 
Election campaigns will be paid for in the billions of dollars, mostly by corporations and by the ultra overpaid owners and executives of those corporations. So what, uh, where are we going and how did we get into this handbasket? <laughs> uh, well, we, we got to where we are uh, b because of money. Uh, and you're about to have it in Australia. You, you're already headed that way with your mining barons uh, deciding that they should own the media and that uh, that they uh, that the uh, that they that money should be able to have a bigger role they should have a bigger role and the way they have a bigger role because they have no popular support actually is in money uh, and that's what happened over about three decades uh, in the United States uh, is the steady inf infusion of greater and greater uh, amounts of money uh, now that was to, to a large degree, that was banned uh, beginning after the Watergate scandal in the 19, early 1970s. Uh, the money in politics was not, entire, was not actually banned, but they had heavy regulation on it. The problem with regulation is that the, the corporate powers have a, you know, entire floors of lawyers <laughs> who are skilled at and hired specifically to punch loopholes uh, into those uh, regulations. So that has been uh, that, that that uh, it, whatever prohibitions we have had against money in politics uh, has steadily been eroded uh, up to uh, two years ago, January 2010, when the Supreme Court, uh, they finally got a, a five-person majority of corporatists on that court that the corporate powers and Republicans and right-wingers have been trying for years to get there. Uh, and they had most of the elements in, but then finally when John Roberts was appointed Chief Justice and then, uh, then a, a, another justice uh, came on, uh, uh, Jim, Alito. You may, you may want to just explain that it, the Supreme Court in uh, the U.S., which makes these tremendously important decisions, is how do, how do people get on it? Uh, yes. Uh, well, you're appointed by the president and then confirmed by the, but you have to have a two-thirds vote. No, 60% vote of the U.S. Senate. 60% vote of the U.S. Senate to get a seat uh, on the Supreme Court. And those tend to be huge battles because it's only nine people on that court, and they're a third branch of government, a co-equal branch of government to the Congress and to the President. Uh, so they wield enormous uh, power. Uh, so for the most part, they have been reluctant to be at all autocratic uh, in the use of that judicial uh, power. Uh, but the bunch that we have on now uh, particularly these five we have, you know, are, are uh, just uh, enthusiastic uh, judicial activists uh, uh, on behalf of the corporate interests whom they had spent their lives representing in their law firms and that sort of thing. And then they get onto the court uh, and then last uh, January 2010 uh, they pass, uh, a, a, they issued an edict on, in a case called Citizens United uh, that said that corporations uh, are people uh, a corporation is a person, uh, and that as a person, under the First Amendment, uh, free speech, uh, that they have uh, the right uh, to use their money, their corporate treasuries, not, their, not the money of their executives, but the corporate treasury itself, to be able to use that money uh, in order to speak in politics. So they said a corporation is a person, and speech is money. Uh, an abomination, first of all, a corporation is not a person until Texas executes one. Let me make that clear. <laughs> but second of all, uh, money is not speech. And if you say that it is, then that obviously means those with the most money have the most speech. And nobody has money comparable to what Walmart has, what uh, General Motors or General Electric has, uh, what these Fortune 500 corporate giants have, uh, just almost bottomless pits of money. Uh, and the executives who will are now deciding to spend that money in a, our elections, and by the way, it's in all elections, not just presidential, not just for national elections, but state and even local elections. Uh, they could come in and in, a, uh, and in an office uh, for city council, uh, they, they, can, they could put a million dollars into somebody or a million dollars into defeating somebody whom they don't want. Uh, so it enthrones them as the power uh, in our elections. Uh, and the court in its, uh, well, you know, it's, 
some level of naivete. None of the five members of the court who voted to do this uh, had ever been in an election, never had run for office, had never been involved in an election. So they had no clue about the power of money. And they actually were naive enough to say that, uh, that the involvement of corporate money, expenditure of corporate money in these kinds of campaigns uh, would not be a corrupting force in politics and nor would it even have the appearance of corruption. I mean, if ignorance is bliss, these people are ecstatic. You know? <laughs> I mean, uh, obviously, uh, it, has, it is leading to tremendous corruption. And Philip and I have just finished uh, on our way down here, actually. The, uh, uh, we were in Byron Bay last night, uh, finished uh, uh, the next issue of, of The Lowdown, which is about uh, the what are called super PACs, PACs or political action committees uh, that, uh, that corporations or others can form. Uh, but now, under the Supreme Court decision, they can form what are called super PACs, meaning these entities can take unlimited sums of money. There's no restrictions on the amount of money that they can take, and then use that money to campaign for or against the candidate of their choice. So the five leading Republican uh, contenders for president this spring, uh, all five of them had super PACs. Uh, and what we have been able to document is that those super PACs, of those, just those five, collected about $94 million uh, in money, uh, and seven men contributed almost half of that. Seven individuals completely shaped uh, and dominated and chose the Republican nominee uh, for president. Uh, it's not about the voters anymore. It's not even about one candidate versus another. It's about one stack of money versus another stack of money. But all those five stacks of money wanted the same thing, which is the plutocracy, uh, the, the greater power for them to reign over it. Just an example of that is, uh, is the Wall Street bailout. Uh, after the Wall Street bailout, great public fury and ang anger about all of that, some reforms that President Obama put in, uh, but again, regulatory reforms. Uh, he chose not to restructure the industry, but to regulate it. Again, I, I can promise you that will be very ineffectual. But even those ineffectual regulations were too much. So Wall Street went crying to the new Congress, uh, to the Republican House of Representatives, and saying, deregulate us, deregulate us. It's too much. The pain is gruesome. One, they should have been fired. They shouldn't even be there. But nonetheless, there they are. Uh, and so they were back lobbying in the House of Representatives, giving them big hugs and whispering little, little sweet nothings into their ear. And in turn, Wall Street is now investing in that Congress, but also wants to find a nominee, specifically Mitt Romney, who will be the Republican nominee for president, to, because Mitt Romney is one of them. He made his fortune uh, by playing Wall Street games. Uh, and uh, that, and he has made a ironclad promise, a blue blood oath, really, he took uh, to them to say that, uh, uh, that he will be their guy, that he will undo these painful regulations that they're having uh, to in endure, uh, painful regulations that are nonsense. So people all over the world are, uh, are dismayed at this blatant buying of uh, seats in Congress and governorships and the White House, uh, and at the results, which is a, a nation in which uh, wealth and the comforts of life are concentrated in the hands of fewer uh, people every year. The 99% are getting less, while the 1% get more. Uh, families that used to own homes and cars and pensions. Uh, kids who would have completed a tertiary education only a decade or two ago can't afford one. And jobs are scarce for Americans, regardless of their qualifications. Uh, and many American families face bankruptcy, and most bankruptcies in America are caused by a health crisis in the family. Even often, very often, for families who have health insurance that they've been paying a fortune for. It, it's virtually impossible to get health insurance in the States uh, for less than 2,000 bucks a month for a family. And uh, even if you do, you can be bankrupt by the cost of bills if you have a, you know, not a huge crisis, cancer or, you know, one of those catastrophic illnesses. Uh, and, and the essential problem here, I think, I believe, is that, uh, that the problem that foreigners and Americans themselves don't quite get is that the wealthy uh, business community in the United States quite simply doesn't care. 
uh, they, and I include most Republican and a good percentage of Democratic politicians, just don't see why the country should pay to keep citizens educated. After all, they can hire people with degrees in other countries, cheaper. They can build factories in other parts of the world where there are fewer regulations uh, of work conditions, fewer regulations of the environmental laws, and fewer taxes. And if that leaves Americans unemployed, poor, and unhealthy, that's not their problem. It's very hard to grasp that. We, we tend to think, uh, isn't America ashamed of the fact that they have such a terrible, for example, child infant mortality rate? And uh, the answer is these people at the top, no, they're not ashamed. They don't care, not their problem. They, they're, they're finding their workforce anywhere in the world that's cheaper. Okay, so my question is to Hightower here, how much of that very bleak analysis do you, uh, do you agree with? Uh, well, all of it, basically. <laughs> Good. Uh, I mean, we didn't rehearse that. What's, bit, what's happening is uh, the United States built up a middle class uh, through the New Deal, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, 1930s, uh, and then after World War II. Uh, continue to build that. And we established the possibility uh, for people to make a, a decent wage, to maybe own a home, uh, to uh, even through something called the GI Bill, to be able to send their kids to college uh, and, uh, and, and to distribute wealth not in, a, in, a, in an equal way, but uh, in, in, a, in enough equality in it uh, that people were okay about it. And that led to great prosperity. We had great economic growth. Uh, but, you know, money's like manure. It, it doesn't do any good unless you spread it around. You know? uh, it, if you just pile it up, it's going to stink. You know? <laughs> so you got to spread, spread it out there. And that's what they did in the New Deal and in, in the 1930s, 1950s, through the 1960s, into the 1970s. But then in the 80s, uh, it began to change. Uh, Ronald Reagan came in, and so we had uh, his trickle-down economic policies. Uh, that if we just make the rich richer, therefore we alter the tax policies, uh, subsidies for the rich, you know, et cetera, then they, in their wisdom, will somehow or other spend that money in such a way that it will eventually trickle down to just ordinary uh, folks. Well, obviously, that, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, but now we've gone from trickle-down economics of Ronald Reagan to the Koch brothers' tinkle-down economics. <laughs> Uh, which Philip just described. They don't give a damn. Uh, they're the top dogs, and we're just a bunch of fire hydrants, you know, out here in the countryside. So, uh, so the the measures that had been put in place, uh, minimum wage, uh, a middle class doesn't exist by accident. A middle class exists by deliberate effort uh, by the people themselves through their government. Uh, so we had minimum wage, pretty good. Minimum wage today is seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. Uh, it's it's the the the, infl the inflation has completely eaten that up. It, that value is now back to what it was in 1960s. Uh, the value of, of the purchasing value of the minimum wage, uh, healthcare. Uh, we had about 60 70 percent of the corporations in the country uh, paid for healthcare and had pretty good healthcare plans. Uh, those have now uh, withered because all the reasons Philip just. Uh, articulated. Uh, so yes, we have a Medicare plan, but that's, that's a universal health care if you're 65 and older. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, there's no push, that, well, there's a push, but there's the Congress is unwilling to consider seriously uh, having what you have, which is health care for everybody, uh, Medicare for all. Uh, you're sick, you, you get help. Uh, in our country, you don't. Uh, and if you're not just poor, but if you're middle class now, uh, your health care is being cut off and you're falling deeper and deeper into poverty, as Philip indicated, if you have one member of your family have a serious illness, all your money is suddenly siphoned off into that. Now you can't make rent, you, you can't, so you're losing your house, you know, right on down the line. So that is what uh, is taking place uh, in, in our country today, is the demise uh, of the middle class. Uh, so, so we've got a, a nation of very rich people, uh, the one percent, uh, but really it's the one-tenth of one percent mm -hmm. that have been taking all of the income, all of the economic increase of the last decade, all of it 
went to the top 90%. Uh, top 10 percent, I'm sorry, T top 10 percent, and the vast majority of it went to the top one-tenth of one percent. So all of us participated in this generating this economic growth, uh, new income, but we didn't get any of it. It all went to the top. In fact, we lost income. The value right, of the, the, wages the sort of wages have gone down, down haven't they, in we real terms down, for, yeah. for a couple of decades, right? right. right. Yeah. So. Well, in the, uh, in the lowdown here and in your radio uh, commentaries, uh, Hightower does a two minute every day, five days a week anyway, commentary uh, about a different subject each day and they're syndicated to a couple of hundred radio stations in America. Uh, and in your speeches and in your latest book, which is called uh, Swim Against the Current, even a dead fish can go with the flow. <laughs> in all of these things, you maintain a conviction that the people are, uh, the American people are, as you put it, uh, revolting <laughs> in the best <laughs> sense, uh, that, that the powers that be will be uh, brought to heel, or at least bypassed by the powers that ought to be, uh, meaning we the people. So can you give us, you know, two or three or four stories or facts that might give us reason to share that optimism. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, again, going back to the first point about do the people still hold those values within them? Yes, they do. Uh, and now they've been stomped on so much. Uh, you know, an old saying, even a dog knows the difference between being stumbled over and being kicked. Uh, and they know that they've been kicked. And so there's a desire to do something about it, uh, but they don't know what. And my party, unfortunately, I, Philip indicated I was elected to two terms in Texas to statewide office uh, as a Democrat. I'm proud to be so, based on the old values of the Democratic Party. But now my party has taken those same corporate checks that the Republicans get. Uh, and if you take that corporate check, written on the back is the corporate agenda. Uh, and, and so my party has drifted away. Some people say we need a third party in America. I wish we had a second one. <laughs> and I wish it would be mine. You know? but. Uh, uh, but because it has not stood up either, the people are in a bit of a quandary. You know, you, you've got to find ways here and there. Now, that's the good news. They are finding it. Part of it is just outright rebellion. Uh, we had the Occupy movement, but uh, even before Occupy, uh, a, a year ago, February, uh, there was an explosion in Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, uh, because a right-wing governor there had just gotten elected. and despite having not talked about any of this in the campaign, came in and immediately said that uh, public employees, uh, in essence, should, uh, should uh, have their wages slashed. Their, uh, he, he pointed to teachers, school teachers, and said, look at them. Said, they're getting pensions. Do you get a pension? You know, so he's pitting, pitting the poorest people against teachers, you know, as though the teachers caused the Wall Street collapse. You know? uh, so it, it, anyway, so pointed to them and in essence was saying, we need to bust the unions. Uh, in our uh, state and proceeded to do so, to ram legislation through uh, the state house. So there's a great rebellion and, uh, and it just it went on and it's still going on. They now have that governor under recall uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin. Well, you under you recall went and talked talk to the crowds that, that, yes, that, and that just assembled on their own in protest of this nonsense right. around the, the capital, uh, the state capital. Yeah. And, and how uh, many folks were there? In February they had it's 20 degrees, uh, snow on the ground. Uh, and uh, 150,000 people, you know, were there, and not just teachers and et cetera, but farmers were doing a tractorcade around the capital you know, in support. And, uh, cops, old folks, and yeah, cops, old folks, uh, children, environmentalists, you know, everybody together uh, with a tremendous spirit. Uh, I mean, just anger to start with, just fury, uh, but a willingness to to try to let's get together and do something about it. Uh, and I, I looked down uh, as I was speaking and. <clears throat> Over here was a lady with a handmade sign. They had a bunch of great signs, and this one said, uh, "You screw us, we reproduce." <laughs> <laughs> and that has happened. They, they, they. That movement has spread all over that state, but also into Ohio, uh, into Texas, into Florida, into Michigan, where there are these right-wing governors who are attempting very similar. Uh, things. In fact, all of this agenda comes from these Koch brothers, uh, yeah, uh, who are two multi-billion-dollar yeah, uh, industrialists. They have the largest private oil company in the world. Uh, they make bounty tiles, and you know, I don't know pr products you might not have over here. So I won't yeah, go into all that. Some but, of them uh, we do. Uh, but they. Uh, 
uh, each of them have uh, assets of uh, $21 billion, it, the two brothers, Charles and David Koch. Uh, and they are far out right-wingers, uh, having inherited that from their father, who was a uh, John Birch Society uh, promoter, uh, who opposed uh, the integration uh, movement in the 1950s and 60s, uh, saying that the black folks who were trying to organize were communists, I mean, all the usual stuff. Uh, and so th that's wh what they come out of. Now they've amassed this fortune, and they've been, for the last 30 years, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to finance right-wing front groups, uh, academic uh, fronts, uh, politicians, uh, and et cetera. Uh, and so they've been behind these Scott Walker, he's the governor of Wisconsin, these other guys, and they're now trying to save Scott Walker from being recalled by the, by the voters. Uh, that vote's coming up in um, September, I think it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, soon. Um, and they write, they have another front group that writes legislation, d yes. don't they, that, are, that, are, that sort of, here's a plan, to, a, a law that will, you know, dis inherit, disenfranchise uh, public uh, workers from, from the, any right. kind of benefits or whatever they've it's come up with. It's a group called ALEC. Uh, and, they, and they write it with a blank, you know, name. You fill in your state here and pass this law. And they send it to their state representatives that they've got all over the country. So that law in Florida that called the stand your ground law that you that you can shoot anybody <laughs> if you feel threatened by them that led to uh Trevon uh, Martin's uh, uh no that's not right it, yeah Troy. uh uh killing uh this young African American uh man barely a man uh 19 I guess wasn't he mm -hmm. uh by this guy uh that law that allowed the guy who did the killing uh, to go home that night free. <laughs> uh, uh, that law came from this organization. Uh, and uh, so that law has already been passed in a number of different states. I think there's about eight of them that have it uh, right now. So, so that's going on, but that's what the Wisconsin Rebellion uh, is all about. And we'll see where that goes, but already it's phenomenal because it is very broad-based and it's got a lot of energy uh, and, uh, and focus. Um, other examples, uh, uh, big money in politics. What can you do about that? Well, we've got to repeal that Citizen United decision, but there's another step we can take, and that is to provide public financing of our elections. That if you are a candidate and you refuse to take the corporate money, then a, a, a competitive amount of public funds will be made available to you. Uh, and th this means not only uh, that you don't have to go uh, kiss the butts uh, of the corporate executives in order to get financing to run for public office, uh, but just regular people can run again. Uh, that a uh, school teacher could run. Uh, uh, more African Americans have been running under this program. More women get elected. Uh, and they have seven states, is it, or six yeah, states? Yeah, seven states. Uh, the state of Maine was, has had it for about 10 years now. And as a result, 84% of their state house and 86% of their state senate has been elected without taking any money uh, from corporate interests. Uh, that completely changes uh, politics there. But it's not just uh, progressive states. Uh, North Carolina has it for their judicial election, New Mexico for their public utility elections. That right, right uh, left-wing state of Arizona has it for their, all of their state elections. Uh, and Janet Napolitano, who is governor of uh, Arizona, uh, was elected under a, uh, a uh, what's called clean election law, public financing, uh, and she said, I could not have run for office for governor of my state, except that that funding was available. But more importantly, she said that with it, I, can, I, could, I was then able to have meetings with legislators uh, without that big gorilla of corporate money and lobbyists sitting in the room with us, because they, did, they went with the, private, with the uh, public financing as well. So you could have an honest discussion about the issue then. You weren't, politicians were not beholden uh, to the money. So that's, uh, that's great. I'll tell you one quick story. There's a guy in uh, Vermont named Fred Tuttle. This was 2006, I believe it was. Uh, uh, I wrote him up in uh, one of my books. Uh, and Fred was a dairy farmer, or is a dairy farmer. Uh, and, uh, and he got pissed off, which is what usually gets people into politics. Uh, and. Uh, and he was pissed off because a, a millionaire from Massachusetts, neighboring state, uh, had moved to uh, Vermont specifically uh, to, to
take over the U.S. Senate seat there. Uh, he had all the money to spend, and that was a nice state. He, he could buy it there pretty cheaply, so he moved to Vermont and going to buy the Senate seat. So Fred said, well, you know, no, uh, I'm going to run. <laughs> and, so, and so he left out there. And, but, of course, Fred had no money, uh, no connections, uh, no party backing, no anything. But what he did have was an integrity uh, and, a, uh, and a fun style of campaigning. Uh, he campaigned on his manure spreader all across, all across the state. Uh, uh, and he would jump up on the manure spreader and give his talk and go on down the Trigal. road. But it, but it led to the greatest bumper sticker I've ever seen. Uh, the bumper sticker was Spread Fred. <laughs> <laughs> And he won. He defeated the millionaire because <laughs> uh, people loved it. You know, I mean, it lasts. Somebody's sticking it to him. Uh, and so, uh, so that, that's a that's a wonderful thing. And we've had one other. I want to leave some time for questions here. But uh, uh, an, another example of something big that has happened in our country that's very little d democratic, uh, very populist, uh, and that is uh, the rise of the good food movement, uh, the uh, organic. Uh, sustainable, uh, local, uh, food artisans, with farmers, with chefs and restaurateurs, uh, uh, with the public school pro uh, uh, lunch programs, uh, and, and et cetera, uh, all across. It's been a huge rebellion. Uh, I call it the upchuck rebellion, <laughs> uh, because consumers just got fed up with this industrialized, conglomeratized food that they were, were getting. Uh, and uh, they wanted something different, and farmers uh, didn't want to use all those chemicals because it was poisoning their water and their families. And so there was this coming together of these two groups, natural ends of the food economy, to say, let's do it differently. Uh, and that, that came through farmers' markets, which when I was ag commissioner, uh, we helped promote uh, that. Uh, my, uh, my cohort and co-author, and. Uh, uh, co-conspirator in all things progressive, Susan DeMarco, and I started out writing a book. The fellow here has a copy of it, just brought it up and showed it to him in 1972, called Hard Tomatoes, Hard Times, uh, about uh, industrialized food uh, coming out of our uh, public uh, agricultural colleges, uh, universities. Uh, and, and how the agribusiness interests were buying those off. And so hard tomatoes referred to a, to a, a, a little thing, the, those old pink tomatoes that used to be in cellophane wrappers that were in the supermarkets. And those came about because Del Monte Corporation in California wanted to get rid of farm workers. Uh, didn't want to have to pay farm workers even though they paid them nothing, but uh, didn't want to bother with the paperwork, I guess. But uh, anyway, they, uh, so they, they went to uh, uh, University of California at Davis, the, the Agricultural University of California, uh, and got them to make a mechanical tomato harvester. And that was great. It would harvest those tomatoes. The problem was it crushed the tomatoes. <laughs> uh, so they then went to Del Monte and other uh, corporations, went to both UC Davis and then also to the university, uh, to Florida's uh, Agriculture University, and got them to design a new tomato <laughs> that could withstand the harvesting. <laughs> and so that was the hard tomato. And so DeMarco, when uh, she was interviewing the head of agricultural research uh, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, and, and uh, he was quite proud of these little nub tomatoes. I uh, uh, said, yeah, buddy, but I mean, they can sit on a shelf for three months. He said, I mean, they're just fabulous, you know. And, uh, and she said, yeah, but you know, I, I grew up in New Jersey and just, just be honest, you know, they don't taste quite as good as those New Jersey tomatoes tasted. And he leaned across his desk to her and he said, your children will never know the difference. <laughs> Right. But that was the great revolt because the children are the ones who led this revolution in food, the Upchuck uh, rebellion. And, and it's not a fringe thing anymore. Oh, no. Very mainstream. Uh, so I mean, mainstream that even Walmart now has to carry organic uh, right. food. Uh, and, uh, and it's the big, it's fastest growing segment of the food economy. It's about uh, $30 billion a year now. Mm -hmm. uh, so just, a, just for the food side of it. Too, right? yeah. And, and, and yeah, the co-ops too, right? Yeah, and the cooperative movement is another really. way, uh, another alternative. All right, well, uh, one little quick okay. one for you before we go to questions. Uh, 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 Australians, I think, understand that the, somebody who has a heart or cares about the common good in America is, is, is called a liberal, and that's almost become a swear word. Uh, and you don't use it uh, to describe yourself, and, and I wouldn't either. <laughs> uh, your term is progressive populist. 
Do you want to just give a yes, you know, couple uh, well, of minutes on what the hell that means? Populism, uh, of course, in many places and including my country, uh, uh, became a, a, a negative term politically because it was considered to be like a charlatan. Somebody who didn't have any values and would just appeal to the, to the masses in the most crass way. Uh, but actually populism comes uh, from uh, a historical reality uh, in the, after the Civil War, the 1880s, 1870s and 80s and 90s in the United States, this movement sprang up and it sprang up out of poor farmers uh, but also urban uh, laborers uh, who were, I mean, abjectly poor uh, and uh, being exploited by the banks who charged too much interest to get the loan that they needed to put their crop in and then exploited by the railroad monopolies that controlled the price uh, that the farmer would get for their commodity to have that shipped to market. Uh, so they created a movement uh, that became known as the populist movement. Uh, it began as what were called farmers' alliances, uh, but it was an economic movement, uh, and it was based on uh, cooperatives. Uh, so there were cooperative banks, cooperative storage facilities, cooperative marketing facilities, and a democratic organization. And then it, it was also a cultural movement because people were literate back then in the rural areas, and so they taught basic uh, literacy, uh, they had uh, cultural programs, they uh, got organized people into choirs and into bands, and they had parades and uh, 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 all, just all kinds of fun. It, it, you know, a movement is not a bunch of committee meetings. <laughs> a movement means rubbing up against each other and, uh, you know, drinking a little beer and wine. Uh, you know, you got to lubricate the movement <laughs> uh, and, uh, and getting to know each other. Uh, and it's, it's cultural, and that's why... The, the most effective way to get the me a progressive message across these days is through music and through art uh, and through literature. It's so much more effective than hearing a speech somewhere, uh, as brilliant as my speeches are. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we, I, I think we as, as, as a progressive entity or progressive people generally don't, don't invest enough in that side of, of the movement. And then it became a political movement uh, as well. And they elected uh, state legislators and senators. They elected uh, governors. Uh, they elected members of the Congress. Uh, they ultimately got uh, defeated because the banks were able to cut off the credit to the cooperatives. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they had a political hiatus as well. But what they supported became law in the United States. The, the populists were the first to support women's suffrage as a political party. They were the first to support direct election of senators. Senators used to be chosen by the state legislature, which means the rich people were the ones who got appointed. Uh, they were the first to call for wage and hour laws for labor, uh, the first to call for minimum wage, the first to call for uh, civil service protection so that uh, it, it wasn't a spoil system of, of government. Uh, you know, a, a number of firsts. The things that they called for uh, were, in fact, uh, enacted. So the people can, uh, can indeed, uh, make a difference. And right. that's kind of, to me, what we've... And now, we're with people, so many people pissed off at the banks and, yeah. and in fact, you know, furious at, at the mass level, even though the politicians are still dickering around with the, the edges. Uh, what, what effect do you see that having in, in terms of elections? I mean, it's very hard to get people elected to the Congress, but how well, it's this, already how happening. Does this play we're, out in the real world. I think we're going to elect some new people to the Congress who are very, very good. A guy in New Mexico, a woman, uh, Elizabeth Warren in uh, Massachusetts, running for U.S. Senate. Tammy Baldwin out of Wisconsin. I think we'll get elected to the Senate. Uh, Norman Solomon in California. We got a bunch of really, you know, dynamic. And these people new, believe in reforming, the, uh, not reforming, but yeah, restructuring, restructuring the banking re, and re, finance, redoing it uh, right, right across uh, uh, the board. Uh, and uh, and then, you know. The, the repeal of Citizen United, that is building up, actually the Occupy kids are doing a, a lot of that work, uh, taking on ALEC. ALEC has been exposed. Uh, That's the, that legislative body yeah. that the, the Koch brothers pay for, that yeah, the writes Koch, the laws for all their little servants around the The Koch country. brothers themselves have been exposed. Uh, but you, you got to realize, and uh, too often uh, in, in my country, people are impatient. You know, they say, well, we elected Obama, and look, he's been a disappointment. I'm going to move to Canada. You know, well, <laughs> well, get a grip, you know. <laughs> you know, you don't win things the first time out, necessarily. You know, usually you don't. Uh, you don't win the second time or third time uh, sometimes. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, the suffrage movement, uh, the three ladies who were the pioneers in that, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the other two, uh, they, they didn't live to vote. Uh, they never got to vote, but they launched a movement that did succeed. Seventy years it took them, but they got there uh, with a constitutional amendment that brought the vote uh, to women. Uh, my friend Willie Nelson put it to me like this once. Uh, he said, Hightower, the early bird might get the worm, but it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you figure that one out, uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think we could go to questions. I do too. Sir, yeah. Here comes, here comes a microphone. Oh, they, yeah, they want you to Thank use you. it. He's right, right up here. Uh, I think what you're suggesting is that uh, in order to solve some of these problems of a dysfunctional government, particularly Congress, is that we got to get, we uh, used to be me then, America, get more people participating. Yeah. A presidential election, you're lucky if you get more than half. Right. Now, what would happen if you went to a, pro a system like we have in Australia, they have in Australia here? Everybody has to vote, yeah. which means that you add to the people in the middle which have different interests than the people on each extreme. Right. Uh, what do you think about this proposal and the likelihood that it might get passed? Uh, well, I, I like the proposal, and, and I think we've got to head in that direction. One, it, it eliminates humongous sums of money that the candidates and the parties have to spend on what's called get out the vote programs and to try to beg people to come uh, to the uh, to the polls and we have quite the opposite problem which is a, a deliberate effort uh, to dissuade people from voting uh, both by the uh, 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 voter ID laws that they're passing again that's something that came out of Alec uh, but uh, you know I, I grew up in the segregated south uh, I went all the way through high school uh, in in uh, in segregated schools, um, but back then you had to pay to vote. Uh, there was a poll tax in Texas, and it amounted to what today would be twenty five dollars. Uh, now guess who they were trying to get not to vote, <laughs> uh, uh, and that was very successful. So we had to beat the poll tax. Uh, but now they've kind of come back cause to get one of these voter IDs if you're not. If, if you don't have a driver's license, say, uh, to get an ID is going to cost you about twenty, twenty-five dollars uh, to be able to get it. To buy an ID. Yeah, and and they write the laws in such ways that uh, the uh, if you're a college student, your student ID doesn't count because they don't want college students voting because they vote progressive. Uh, and if you're in the military, your military ID won't count. You could have been seven tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they wouldn't let you vote <laughs> if you didn't have. The, the right document. I mean, this is the insanity of, of the level that we're at. So something like you're saying is to me the kind of proposal that, uh, that we progressives have got to put forward. We've been too meek. Uh, we've been too, uh, 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 we've lacked boldness. So we put forward these little minor ideas uh, rather than going right at them. Let's re reconstruct Wall Street by taking that money out of the city group and uh, Goldman Sachs and et cetera and move it out to the community banks and out into the uh, credit unions uh, uh, where it'll do some good. Uh, let's, uh, let's have uh, required voting, uh, not just try to, well, let's fight to get rid of these voter ID laws. Well, we've got to do that, but here's, here's a structural solution right. uh, that would just be huge. So we've got to pursue structural. But, but that's not going to come from even uh, in Obama. It's going to come from no. people uh, at the grassroots. Right. Uh, and, and the other thing about, you know, getting people, more people to vote is, is as Hightower's book title put it, you know, you give us candidates yeah. and people might be ready to go out and vote for them. Yes, sir. Uh, here you go. No. Uh, uh, he needs to stay <laughs> up here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. A couple of years ago, I read the uh, autobiography of Henry Ford. It was published in Australia in 1924. I've, I felt like sending a copy of that to every single politician in America because he was a, he was a socialist, and in fact he was attacked. I mean, you were talking about going back decades. This has been going on since then. Yeah. He was attacked by a group of of um, car, other car manufacturers for paying his workers too much. Yeah, right. And and, and there's a whole lot of stuff in that book that, that yeah. just against war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know. Yeah. 
Have you read? Have you read? Yes. It? Yeah. Yes. And and Henry Ford's notion was to pay five dollars a day, which was considered just exorbitant at that time uh, when he first started his assembly line process. Uh, but his logic was unassailable, which is, I would like my workers to be able to buy a Ford. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So that was good. But uh, don't get too carried away for Henry Ford uh, because he, he went a little batshit over Hitler. Uh, <laughs> the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. okay. And even a little batshit over Hitler yeah. is not good. On the topic of a uh, potential second or third party, as you mentioned, um, I was just wondering of your opinion of um, somebody like a, a libertarian Republican like Ron Paul. Yeah. Do you think that his approach has any merits in the ideal? And also, as a practical matter, do you think it's yeah. got any merits, like both perspectives? Because one might answer the other. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I know Ron Paul, and when I had a radio talk show for a number of years, and, uh, and would have him on uh, periodically, uh, in part for amusement's sake. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, he's got integrity on his libertarian views. Uh, he, he sticks with them. Uh, he sticks with them right over the cliff. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, certainly, uh, much I support. Uh, Obviously, uh, he doesn't think the government has any business uh, in the, the, the women's wombs, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't like these uh, wars rampaging around the world, uh, et cetera. But he also doesn't like Social Security. He doesn't like uh, the environmental protection laws, you know, so he... Well, he's already had an imp he's already having an impact. He, he's narrowed him his the impact he wants to have down to to the Republican Party. He wants to have the Republican Party be the Libertarian Party. That's not going to get there because the Republican Party needs the corporate interests, and they're not they want government. They just want it in their pocket. Uh, so they they believe in big government uh, serving uh, them. But uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, it's it's got uh, it's got a lot of appeal. I mean, I've got a lot of libertarianism in me. You know, uh, people are a mix, right? We're mutts and mavericks. We're not uh, we're not one thing or another. I'm a liberal. Well, yeah, but you got some conservative views too, uh, and, and some libertarian views uh, within you. And that's what we that's we need to build on that uh, and and tap the most progressive elements of all of that. Get the get a lady. Somebody over here. Get, get the woman. woman. Get a lady, yeah. <laughs> One of those two. There she is, over there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we need some over here. Too. Have a bit of equality here for women. Um, <laughs> hi, Jim. Melina Morrison from the International Year of Cooperatives in Australia. Yeah, it's very great. good. Yes, yes. It's fantastic to hear you talk about the role of cooperatives, particularly in the progressive um, populist movement in the US. Can you talk to us about what you think might be the role of cooperatives in economic and social empowerment going forward? Yeah. And yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking now that that trend in, uh, towards pl plutocracy that you've been talking about has been played out in the cooperative sector as well with some yes. high profile demutualizations of yeah. iconic cooperative brands. Right. So we're coming off the back of right. that and we need to reconnect people with this fantastic sector. Yes. How I can, agree. How can co-ops be more populist again. Well, they already are being, uh, but you're, you're right. There are some, some of the giant co-ops, uh, Sunkist, uh, Citrus, for example, in our country, uh, others are, are, in, are in fact corporate, uh, just corporations. They're nothing else. They've abandoned the, the principles of cooperation, which are little d democratic principles. Uh, but the cooperative movement is huge in, in our country. In Austin, where I live, uh, by the way, t I come to you not just from Austin, but from South Austin, and there's an <laughs> important uh, attitudinal difference. Uh, our, our unofficial slogan over there is, we're all here because we're not all there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> But, but we're big supporters. We have Wheatsville Co-op, which is a very successful 30-year food co-op. We have uh, a, uh, a, a nursery co-op, uh, people's nursery, little kids, uh, that's been going since 1952. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a co-op radio station whose letters are K-O-O-P. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, gr the greatest advance in co cooperative uh, enterprises in, I don't know, hundreds of years, and that is a cooperatively owned pub in our city <laughs> uh, that, uh, that I'm a member of. I'm a member of all of those, actually, uh, and a worker uh, uh, cooperative, uh, as well, worker rights uh, cooperative as well. So this is spreading very, very fast. Uh, there's 70,000 co-ops in America. The biggest percentage of those are credit unions, but still. 
st still hold those values, and uh, uh, many millions of people uh, belong to them, and it's just going to get better. It's, it's another way to organize capitalism besides corporate elitism. Uh, it's a democratic way to organize capitalism. Okay, last question with the red hat. I'm going to ask you about fracking. Oh. What sort of things are you doing to try and stop that? Yes. Protests here against it. Just yes. recently. She's asking about, about fracking, fracking. Yeah. Uh, which is the, I guess you know, the, the, the just crude, abusive mining method of, uh, of drilling deep holes uh, in, well, first, of going onto somebody's property, farmers, uh, uh, without even needing to ask, uh, and beginning to drill holes. Uh, and then if they, they, they find that there's methane gas down there that they're wanting to release, what's called uh, coal seam gas, uh, then that they inject huge volumes of water under pressure with some 600 toxic chemicals in it uh, to f explode the rock so that the gas can come forth. Uh, and. Uh, you know, it just Lily Tomlin once said, "No matter how cynical you get, it's almost impossible to keep up." You know? <laughs> and I, that's what I think of when I when I hear this method. All right, so y'all have got great protests. Uh, Philip and I were in Lismore uh, uh, early this week, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah early this week. Ago, yeah. yeah, right. And uh, <laughs> and they had just had seven thousand people in Lismore against uh, coal seam mining. Bridge. Uh, up there against fracking. And we're having the same fight uh, in the United States. Uh, we have won some battles. Uh, the big battle that we've got to do is to stop the, uh, the, the deniers that, that there's any environmental problem with this. And that's what the mining companies uh, want to pretend. In our country, it's mostly oil companies that are doing it. Um, and but the Koch uh, brothers are big funders of the denial of right. all of these things. Deni there is no global warming, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the, the, the David Koch was trained as a scientist, but he's cynical enough to do this. Yeah. So what it comes down to is that we have to, we, we have to do more, you know, because the powers that be are not going to do it for us. The other one's doing it to us. So, so the real power is always in, in countries like Australia and the United States is in the people themselves. And, and that's why we have to have these, these movements uh, and, and a movement that is bold and aggressive uh, and in their face. That's how we got the New Deal. That's how we got the middle class. Uh, that, that's how we stopped the robber barons in, in the uh, late 1900s. Uh, uh, yeah, late 1900s. Uh, that's how we got suffrage. That's how we got every fight that we have won has been through confrontation, through the people themselves rising up. I'll leave with this. There's a, it's, it's a, uh, something that Louis Grizard, the late great humorist uh, out of Georgia, uh, once said. He said that there's said something that we in the South have always known to be true, and that is that there's a great big difference between being naked and being naked. Uh, being naked means you have no clothes on, but being naked that means you have no clothes on and you are up to something. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Folks, uh, uh, our time is up. Now, uh, in practical terms, Jim is going to be at Glee Books, and there's a few, only a few of his books there, and he'll sign them and, and sell them. Uh, I have a bag full of copies of The Lowdown. Anyone who wants them, come up, uh, and, and I'll give them to you. Uh, so uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to the uh, Sydney Writers' Festival yes. folks, uh, Chip and, and the crew, for putting us in, uh, in the program after, uh, after all the acceptances had closed. Uh, and uh, finally, thanks to Jim Hightower for and spending time here. <laughs>